Ah, there we go. All right. Um, Kia ora koutou. Thank you for joining us tonight. As I said before, I'm Jen Tyson, Marketing and Comms Manager for Nowak New Zealand. Uh, we run these webinars as frequently as we can um, and as topical as we can. So lovely to see you all here. We've had a, a large number of people register for this webinar. So there's going to be people jumping in throughout. I'll manage that. And we're also obviously recording it um, for people who have registered, but they can't attend, so they want the recording. So tonight we have joining us Liz Coe, and uh, Liz Coe has a fantastic history of um, helping people understand how to manage their money on a lot of levels. Uh, and for what we wanted to do here for NARWIC was we really acknowledge that everybody might be at, and money's a massive topic, right, Liz? So we could be talking about this all day long. Absolutely. Yep. Yes. So what Liz is going to bring tonight is a bit of a blend. And thank you for those that actually put questions in your registration um, process. Uh, Liz has had a look at those and hopefully she will just cover those off organically as we go through. Um, rather than sort of picking them off one by one. But a couple of things I just want to let everybody know tonight is that we're going to, Liz is going to try and cover it off from a broad, broad spectrum of taking it from, you know, if you're just kind of trying to save some money and really start out getting amassing some money and what, and then she's going to go into what to do with it and some stuff around paying mortgages off. And, and uh, Liz has some fantastic resources available for people, which I'll share in the chat at some point. Um, please put any questions that come up through the session or um, you feel didn't get answered into the chat. And we've also got a little bit of a follow-up option, which we'll talk about a bit later, is if you get you have a gnarly question and it doesn't get answered, um, you can just email me and I'll also drop Liz's website in as well. So um, without further ado, welcome Liz. Thank you for taking your time out of your evening to spend with us and uh, talk about this valuable topic. How about you just start by giving yourself a bit of an introduction and uh, and then you can get started into the first part of your presentation. Sure. Look, thanks so much, Jen. Uh, look, I, I really welcome this opportunity because I just love talking to people about money because I know what a difference it makes to people um, getting good advice and having a good understanding of how to manage their money. So I've uh, I was a financial advisor for over twenty years, about you know twenty three, twenty four years. I'm no longer giving personalised financial advice. So I just want to point that out. I gave up my uh, registration a couple of years ago when I sold my business. I did set up another business. It's a, a, a website called Enrich Retirement where I offer retirement planning resources for people. And there's quite a lot of free information on there which you're welcome to delve into. There's also a subscription element to it for um, some of the, the meteor resources as well. So have a look at that. But anyway, today we're gonna cover as much as we can about my favorite topic, which is money. So we're going to be looking at basically what you might call budgeting and saving. And I look, I want to start by saying I really hate those words. And I want to get you to think about reframing them. So rather than talking about budgeting, I like to talk about money management. And so that's about being proactive with uh, how you prioritize the spending of your money and choosing how and when you spend it, rather than, um, you know, your money managing you, which is what happens to a lot of people, you know, where you're living from payday to payday. So I'll show you a really little uh, easy system for managing your money proactively. <clears throat> and the other thing I want to tell you is that the word saving is not a bad word because at the end of the day, we all, uh, all money that we receive has to be spent by somebody. So saving is not, it's not like that diet word, you know, where if you're on a diet, you miss out on eating, eat, eating food. Saving is choosing to spend later. And I think if you can get your head around that, it makes an enormous difference to the psychology of saving. So saving is just saying, I'm going to put some of my income aside for later on and I'll spend it then. Because as we know, you know, when you, when you leave this earth, and you can't take money with you. So if you don't spend it, someone else will. That'll be your children or the beneficiaries of your estate. So your challenge throughout life is to decide who's going to spend your money and when it's going to be spent. 
So let's just kick off. And um, <clears throat> I do want to start by saying that um, uh, this is not personalized advice. As I say, I, I'm no longer able to give personalized advice. So the information I talk about tonight is general in nature and really to understand more about how it applies to you in particular, you should go and see a financial advisor to, to follow up. So yeah, please be aware that this is general advice. I'm going to start talking uh, by talking about some of the psychological stuff, because believe me, there is a huge psychological element in terms of managing money. And, you know, we all have different attitudes towards money, which come from different things in our past, comes from beliefs about money that we have, you know, <clears throat> um, maybe you've heard old sayings, you know, money is the root of all evil, or waste not, want not, all those kind of things that we grew up with, and that alters our, our um, relationship with money. Uh, we have different levels of respect for money. Some people respect it highly, others disrespect it and, and uh, don't take good, good care of it. Uh, some of our past experiences can influence us. So if we've had um, times where we've lost money through investing or we know somebody who's lost money through investing, that can alter our attitudes as well. Our perceptions of wealth, you know, some people perceive themselves to be extremely wealthy because compared to their peers, their friends, they have a lot more, whereas other people might uh, do the opposite. You know, compared to their peers, they might perceive themselves as being actually not wealthy when in fact they probably are. Uh, your stage of life can affect your attitudes. So, you know, when you're young, you're a lot more carefree, a lot more um, risk-taking. As you get older, you get more conservative. And just, you know, your overall motivation and your, um, you know, your, your ability to discipline yourself. So all these things uh, affect our attitude uh, towards money and the way in which we manage it. So <clears throat> I did a lot of um, thinking about this when I was in my practice. And I actually wrote a book called Your Money Personality, which I still have a few copies of. It's, it's a little bit old now, but the, the message is still good. So I talk about four different money personality types. and the key drivers for your money personality are your willingness to take risk and your desire to create wealth. And if you go onto my website, you can find out a little bit more about this and you can even do a, a test to find out what your money personality is. So we have people who are hoarders and these are the ones that like to salt money away and you know count it. And, you know, they don't like spending it. They like to just know that it's there. We probably all know somebody like that. Maybe it's your parents or your grandparents but it might even be somebody, you know, that's in your, uh, that's a bit younger. Um, <clears throat> then we have the achievers, and these are the people who uh, have a low um, desire, uh, a, a low willingness to take risk, but they desire to have wealth or to have the illusion of wealth. And these people tend to have, you know, a lot of assets, but also a lot of debt, uh, because they like to have it here and now, you know, they like to have the the best house in the street and the, the, the latest car and go on holidays in Fiji once a year. But, you know, they've, they've got huge debt to go along with that. <clears throat> then we have thrill seekers who have um, a high willingness to take risk, pretty low desire to, um, to create wealth. And these are the ones that really live from payday to payday and often their credit cards are maxed out. They, they're risk takers because they gamble with their futures. You know, they don't worry about the long term. So long as they've got enough money to pay their rent or their mortgage this week and they can, you know, buy their groceries, they don't really care about what happens to them, say, in retirement or, you know, further down the track. Then we've got <clears throat> the true entrepreneurs who are the, the, the risk takers and the people who desire a lot of wealth. <clears throat> and um, the funny thing about entrepreneurs, though, is that, uh, by and large, they're not really driven by wealth. They're driven by doing things really well and they enjoy what they do. You know, um, people like Warren Buffett, for instance, who just loves uh, making money on deals, you know, and he, you know, he's got billions already, but he, you know, he still does what he loves doing. So, so these are basically the four money personality types. And you'll find that there'll be one or two of those that resonate with you that are your <clears throat> strongest um, personality types. And None of them are right or wrong. 
Uh, they're just different. And where you get arguments in a relationship, it's often because you have a different money personality than your partner does. You know, you have someone who's more into spendings or someone who's more into saving, someone who's more into risk taking and someone who's uh, more conservative. That's what causes the tension in relationships. So it's well worth, you know, doing that little test, get your partner to do it as well and find out uh, what your differences are and just know that it's not right or wrong, it's just different and you have to respect the other person's um, different attitudes. So that's just a quick summary there of um, you know, hoarder, achiever, entrepreneur, thrill seeker, and um, <clears throat> the different personality types. Um, so you know, when it comes to wanting to, to save and do things with your money, the starting point is to say, you know, what's important about money to you? Because money has no intrinsic value in itself. It only has value when you spend it. And I want to make that quite clear. So having a big pile of money in the bank is completely useless if you really, if you've got no idea what you're going to spend it on, because it's it's an enabler. It helps you enjoy life. So you've got to think about what are the things that give you the greatest joy in life. And then think about how money can enable you to achieve those things. So, you know, is it travel? Is it having, you know, fast cars? Is it having a nice house? Is it spending time with your family and friends? Is it saving for retirement? Maybe there's a spiritual aspect to it or community aspect to it. So really think about, you know, what is it you want to achieve out of life? What brings you the greatest joy? And then we come back to saying, well, how much money do you need to achieve those things and, and when is it you might um, need to spend it? You know, how much will you need? So <clears throat> some of your goals might be to get rid of debt, to buy a house, have an overseas trip, buy a business, buy a car, save for retirement, et cetera, et cetera. So <clears throat> be really clear on what those things are because that's what will give you the motivation to do things differently and, you know, to, to save. In other words, to set money aside to spend later. Because you really, you know, money is a limited resource. So when you spend it, you want to make sure you're spending it on the things that matter the most to you. You know, you don't want to go and waste it all on, you know, lattes and avocado on toast, as they say, when you really uh, would love to do an overseas trip instead. So you know, get that motivation by really understanding what your goals are. So, and if you can quantify them, you know, put a time frame around them and a dollar amount. Um, that will give you a bit of an incentive. So, yeah, maybe you want to buy a car in two years' time, 15000 so for an overseas holiday, maybe you're saving a deposit for a house. Whatever it is, you know, set yourself a, a goal that's measurable. So <clears throat> we're, we're really talking tonight about creating wealth. And the first step in creating wealth is the hardest one. This is the one that 90% of people can't do. If you can do this first step, then everything else is quite easy. So the first step in creating wealth is to spend less than you earn, which is another way of saying, you know, you have to learn how to save. And believe me, pretty much anybody can save. I mean, there is an element of the population, yes, who will probably never be able to do that. But I would say for most of you um, on this webinar, there's probably at least something you can set aside if you really want to. It's just a question of um, setting out your priorities and what you want to spend your money on. So <clears throat> let's think about, you know, where does all your money go? And you need to have a good understanding of that because it can disappear really quickly. And, you know, I often tell a story of uh, my daughter who went off to university at 16. She was 16 and a half. And she got herself a course-related costs loan to buy a computer, $1,000. And she put it in her bank account when she got it, uh, you know, was left it sitting there waiting till she could find herself a nice computer. And she rang me up one day and she said, Mum, Mum, that $1,000 that I got has all disappeared. And I thought, oh, that's a bit odd. <laughs> I wonder what's going on there. She said, oh, the bank's lost it. So... She, I said, look, give me your login details to your bank account. And um, so I went into her bank account. And of course, what did I see? I saw lots of tiny little transactions, two or three a day, uh, where she'd use the FPOS or the ATM 
And, you know, she's taken out lots and lots of small amounts over a period of a, a couple of weeks, and that $1,000 had been spent. That's where her money went. And quite honestly, people who struggle to save, it's not often not because they're buying big, expensive things that they can't afford. It's because they're buying lots and lots of little things that add up um, <clears throat> to a big amount. And it's what I call leaky bucket syndrome. So there's those little fragments, you know, a coffee here or a wine there, a magazine, a, you know, movie, a night out the movies, whatever. And all those little items add up. So if you imagine a bucket with your income going in, out the bottom is a whole lot of holes that just drip your money out and it's wasted. And so that's what we've got to do. We've got to plug up the holes in the leaky bucket. So here's my little system. <clears throat> So, and it's, it is really simple. So we've got to start by looking at how much it costs you to live. And quite honestly, you know, you want to keep this to a minimum. You want to, you want to have your day-to-day -day living costs at a, you know, a sort of an average amount that gives you a reasonably comfortable lifestyle. But, you know, you don't want to go overboard on it because the more you spend on your day-to-day -day living, the less you've got to, uh, to save to do the fun stuff, like go off on holidays or you know save for your house deposit, whatever. So you've got to work out what your daily living expenses are. And <clears throat> daily living expenses uh, come in three different categories. So there's your known expenses, uh, <clears throat> which are uh, things like rent or mortgage. They, they tend to be... Um, uh, things that uh, you're, you're committed to. So known expenses, you've got your personal expenses, which are things you buy just for you and your household expenses. So let's just look at those in more detail. So your known expenses are financial commitments. You can't avoid paying them. You know, you can't not pay your rent or your mortgage. You can't not pay your insurance premiums or your car registration, uh, school fees, et cetera, et cetera. So you want to make a list of what they all are so you know how much that adds up to because that money is already committed out of your income. And so what we're going to do later on is set aside enough out of your income to cover those financial commitments um, because that's not your money. Somebody's already claimed it. Then we have at the other end of the spectrum the completely discretionary money. That's non-essential spending and that's your coffees and avocado on toast, your movies, your gifts, um, hobbies, all that kind of thing. So this is money that you actually, you don't have to spend it. If, if you didn't spend money on these things, you wouldn't die. Um, you just have a really miserable life. <clears throat> and I think, and this is the leaky bucket stuff. And this is what we need to try and contain if we want to start saving. So that's the two ends of the spectrum. And then in the middle, we have variable household expenses these are a half and half so there's an element that you have to spend but an element that you can control and the biggest one there is food you know if you look at your outgoings after rent and mortgage your food is your biggest expense now with food you have to buy some yes but you can choose how much you spend so you can go to the supermarket you can spend you know, $300, $500, $100, whatever, depending what you put in your trolley. And if you're struggling to find ways to save, take a look at your food budget. So you need to allocate um, some money for that. But um, uh, we, again, we need to kind of set priorities. So this is the little simple little equation that I use. So this is your money management system. You work out what your net income is after paying tax, KiwiSaver, child support, whatever, whatever. That's your net income per fortnight, month, however you want to measure it. <clears throat> out of that, we set aside what we, what we need to achieve our long-term goals, which might be paying off the mortgage uh, while you've still got a mortgage. You need to set aside... Uh, what you want to um, have for short-term saving, for your holidays, saving up for your house deposit, et cetera. And the rest is your daily living expenses. So your known expenses, you know what they are. Your personal expenses, you need to pick a number and live with it, right? It's like paying yourself some pocket money. And so if you put a limit around it, then once that money is spent, too bad, 
you've got to be disciplined and say no more till next payday. Then you've got an amount that you set aside, just work out how much you need for those household expenses. So that's an equation, right? Your income has to equal the sum of all those things, right? Your long-term saving, your short-term saving, and your day-to-day -day living expenses. And as I said earlier, the higher are your daily living expenses, the less you're going to have for your short and long-term saving. You need to make the choice. You need to manage this proactively from the top down and make a decision about how you want to allocate your income. And most people don't do that. Most people spend, and then if there's anything left over, that's what they save, and it's usually not a lot. So that's not being in control of your money. So how do we do this? We get buckets of money. I love buckets. I use them a lot when I'm talking about money. Uh, and I'll show you what I mean by that. So we need to set up different buckets for our different types of spending. So you can see here we've got our income coming in. Uh, we put that into an account from which our known expenses are paid. So um, remember, known expenses are our financial commitments. And then from there, we hive some off into savings before we spend, right? So that's an automatic process. We hive some off into our personal expenses. And if you're in a relationship, you each need a personal expenses account. So you've got your own money that you're in charge of without having to explain what you've spent it on. Because, you know, us women really don't like sneaking pairs of shoes in the back door uh, <laughs> that we put in, in the sale. Um, so we each need to have our own money that we can spend on whatever we want, and that's an agreed amount. Uh, and then we have an amount for our variable household expenses. So, so these are all different bank accounts, right? So when we look at how we set it up, so the money that our uh, the bank account that our income goes to, and this is really really important should have no FPOS link to it. It should be online banking only. It, but it, that's where all your automatic payments and direct debits come from, because usually that's how you pay those financial commitments. So uh, they're normally done by AP or, or direct debit. So your income goes into the account where your known expenses are paid. We leave enough behind to cover the, the amount, because it's a known amount, right? If we had FPOS linked to it, we're in danger of running out of money, right? We're just remembering that money is already committed, already spoken for. It's not our money in essence. Then we have money go off into our savings account, which is um, a high interest account, or it might be a uh, mortgage offset or a line of credit. I'll talk about that a bit later. Um, <clears throat> we have personal expenses, which are our FPOS uh, which is the, the number two option on EFPOS card. So you have single, you know, individual accounts if you're in a relationship. So each partner has their own personal account, which is the number two option on EFPOS, and then a joint account for variable household expenses. Now, I know some people like to manage their money completely separately, and you can still do that. So you can have uh, your income going into separate accounts and then have... Um, money hiving off into joint accounts for your known expenses and your household expenses, if that's how you wish to do it. So it's really up to you to design your own system. The important thing here is to ring fence those different types of, of spending, because that's how you get to control your money. You know, if you can ring fence those financial commitments, then, um, you know, you know that money is there, you're never going to run out, you're never going to run short of, of paying your rent, and you know that the other money you can spend um, freely without having to worry about meeting those commitments. Your personal expenses, uh, as I say, give yourself an amount that you stick to, and that's your limit. It's like, just like when you had pocket money as a child, and you run out of pocket money, dad says, well, sorry, that's it, wait till next week. Um, and that's Liz, so can I ask a question? Um, yes, that absolutely. savings, that savings um, that you've put there, do you um, do you kind of have a rule of thumb around how much 
people should save or is that a very personal thing in terms of what they're saving for and their goals but is it like a pick a number thing like you said before pick a number for your spending money and stick to it is it the same like you work backwards so you want to save for a five thousand dollar trip so you work out you know the you do the math backwards and you think well I need to save a hundred dollars a week for that and then yep. I just stick to that that's um, exactly right. But it depends what your goals are and depends what standard of living you're comfortable with. You know, some people can live really, really frugally. Um, and, uh, you know, they live off the smell of an oily rag because they want to save heaps. Others say, well, actually, you know, I like to go out with my friends on Friday nights and, you know, spend money on my kids and whatever. So, you know, you have to it's all about making choices, you know, and you can't make any mistakes with with, with making choices, so long as you understand the consequences of the choices you make. So if you choose to have a low level of savings, you need to be aware of what the consequences of that might be. Um, so in terms of not being able to achieve your goals, not being able to retire quite so early. So you've got to, you know, it's, it's just a judgment call. It's not right or wrong. Some people might say, oh, to heck with it. I don't care if I live in poverty and retirement. Okay, that's their choice. If they understand that that's where it's leading to, that they're going to be in poverty and retirement, and they're okay with that, that's fine. Who am I to say that's the wrong thing to do? Would you uh, say that so someone might need multiple, like you've got a few ex accounts there. Um, if, if someone's saying, well, I want to save for a trip, but I'm also saving for something else, like, I don't know, retirement or or buying a house, and they're quite separate big things, would you then say to someone that they would be best to set up a couple of different saving avenues for that? If that's what works better for you, yes. But in general, and I'll come on to it, it's going to talk about getting your mortgage paid off quicker. You really ideally want to chuck all your savings into either a line of credit or an offset facility against your mortgage. You know, plow as much as you can into that throw all your savings into there. Um, just, you know, making sure that you, the savings are enough to do everything you want to do. Uh, and in that way, you're minimising your mortgage interest payments. But it's, it's whatever works for you. As I say, there's no right and wrong. You have to find a system that works. So long as you're using these principles of, you know, ring fencing things to the level of detail that you, that you want to go to, you can go overboard. You know, I've seen people with, you know, 10 or 15 different accounts. Well, to me, that's unmanageable. You can't keep track of everything that way. I like to have this really simple system uh, where, you know, you can easily have an overview of, of what's happening rather than trying to, you know, add up 15 different numbers to see, to see where you're at, you know. <laughs> but, you know, I'm not a detailed person, but some people are, you know. <laughs> okay, shall we move on? Yeah, thank you. That was great. Just had a few questions. Just remember, if you're listening and you've got questions, um, feel free to sort of just chuck them in the chat and I'll interrupt Liz um, for you if you're feeling like there's something that's not being answered. But it's it's really good, Liz. Thank you. So the next question is, you know, once you're able to save, um, what do you do with it? So there's an order of priority in, in what you do with your savings. And I'm not saying you should do these in a linear order. You can do them in parallel. So this is just, though, it just sets out the emphasis of where, you, you know, what you'd focus on. So you focus initially on getting rid of short-term debt, pay off your credit card, those door cards, you know, everything that's got, you know, 20 something percent interest, just get rid of it as quickly as you can. Um, you need to also have an emergency fund, which, um, you know, the rule of thumb on that is you need to have access to, say, three months' worth of living expenses. Now, that doesn't have to be held in cash. Again, you can use the mortgage offset line of credit um, as a way of, of getting access to cheap money or cheaper money uh, for emergency purposes. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so once you've got those two things under control, if you haven't already bought a house, then save to buy a house because we've all learned that lesson over the last few years about how important it is to have some exposure to the property market in New Zealand. Not all countries are the same as what we are. Um, 
but in New Zealand, you do really need, uh, by the time you retire, you need to have a debt-free home and some retirement savings. And quite honestly, if you need a debt-free home at retirement, then the sooner you buy it, the better. Your next challenge is to pay off your mortgage, and we can talk about that in a minute. And then once you've done that, uh, set up an investment portfolio. Now, I did have a question about should I pay off my mortgage or should I invest? When you've got a mortgage, the only investing you should be doing is into KiwiSaver because you get all the tax credits and that kind of thing. So you've always got to look at what's the return on your money. So if you're paying, I don't know, say 7% on a mortgage, you need to be earning more than 7% after tax with certainty on an investment to make investing more worthwhile than paying off your mortgage, right? So the best return on your money is what you get from paying off your mortgage. It's a guaranteed rate of return of whatever your mortgage interest rate is after tax. So that's the return you get. Paying off your mortgage gives you the net return of whatever your uh, interest rate is. So unless you've got a whiz-bang investment that's guaranteed, no risk, that, and uh, that pays more than that, and good luck finding one, <laughs> then you should really focus on paying down that mortgage as quickly as you can. I'm talking there about a mortgage on your own home. Um, a rental property is a whole different story uh, because yeah, there, there can be some differences there in terms of um, the return. So the next thing you do is set up an investment portfolio. Um, you make sure you're still you know, contributing into KiwiSaver, you just you only want to put into KiwiSaver whatever you need to put in to get all your, your benefits. So your employer contribution, your tax credit. Don't put more than that in because it's locked in until you retire. So just put that minimum in, especially uh, while you've got a mortgage and especially if you've got a long way to go till you retire because otherwise yeah, it's locked in until you're 65 or so. So um, then set up an investment portfolio once your mortgage is gone. The other really important thing is to protect your wealth. And that basically means things like insurance, things like um, contracting out agreements if you're in a relationship. Um, you just make it because, you know, people often forget this. It's one thing to create wealth, but you've also got to protect it, look after it. I've seen so many things happen where, you know, people's wealth gets eroded by all sorts of things going wrong, you know, divorce, redundancy, illness. You know, if you haven't got income protection insurance, that can really um, put a huge dent in your wealth. So that's basically my simple little step-by-step um, -step system for creating wealth. But the number one thing, as I said, is to be able to have that surplus, you know, spend less than you earn, create that surplus, that savings to do all these things with. If you're not doing step one, you're not going to do any of this stuff here, right? So that's really important to be able to do that. So if you want to pay off short-term debt, um, make a list of all your debts, pay off the ones with the highest interest rate first, and you know, set up an automatic payment um, to get rid of them as quickly as possible. Now, there was a question, I think, about somebody who said um, uh, they had a joint credit card with their partner, and their partner didn't want to pay it off quickly, whereas this lady did. Well, I think that's a really bad situation to be in. Firstly, you shouldn't be clocking up big balances on your credit card. So actually, the other thing I should have said about that money management system is if you do use a credit card, and I strongly recommend you use a debit card rather than a credit card, only use it on one of those categories of spending. You know, only use it on just your personal or just your household expenses. Don't use your credit card for a whole range of different types of spending. Otherwise, your money management system will get out of control. So um, I would say in this situation, you and your partner should probably have separate credit cards. So you can make your own decisions about when you pay them off and maybe just use them, using them for personal expenses. Um, uh, you know, people get... Um, you know, carried away with, with earning, you know, flybys points or, you know, other sort of bonus points on a credit card. Honestly, you'll find that you'll be financially better off 
if you just use your credit card sensibly rather than getting all the bonus points. You know, it'll make such a difference to your money management if you ring fence those different categories rather than lumping them all into your credit card. You'll be much better off at the end of the day. So don't get bedazzled by all the, you know, those bonuses and things. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, yes, so work your way down the list. Another way to approach um, those lists of short-term debts, some people like to start with the smallest ones first to give them a sense of satisfaction they've paid them off and work down to the bigger ones, but really um, uh, the best way to do it is to start with the highest interest rate one and you know, get rid of that first. So do that, have, then once you've cleared all that debt, think about setting up your emergency fund, that's three months worth of living expenses. And um, that covers your unexpected expenses, you know, like the car breaks down, the fridge blows up, or you, you know, your tooth needs a thousand dollars worth of dental treatment. It also covers loss of income, you know, loss of your job or getting sick, that kind of thing. So you, if if you've still got a mortgage, then um, you know I like to have part of a mortgage as a mortgage offset facility or a line of credit. So what that means is having part of your mortgage at a floating rate. Uh, might be just a small part, you know, twenty or thirty thousand dollars or so, and you put all your savings into that so that you're in effect paying zero interest on that segment of your mortgage. That's where you keep all your savings because let's face it, you're only going to get a very small amount, you know, a couple of percent if it's in a savings account, whereas if you're offsetting it against your mortgage, you're going to get six or seven percent return by saving that amount on your mortgage. So if you're not sure what a mortgage offset facility is or a line of credit, go and talk to your um, mortgage advisor or your bank and, and ask about uh, having that kind of system set up. You'll find more information on that also on my website if you look around in some of the articles there. Um, I probably haven't got time at the moment to go into it in great detail, but um, you know we could certainly cover it at a later date if, if people are interested. Um, <clears throat> okay, so then the next big challenge is to have a debt-free home by the time you retire. But you might also want to get want to, want to get into property investing. And I don't have a question about that. Someone says, um, you know, basically, kind of, how do you get into it? Well, let me say, property investing is not for novices. You absolutely have to know what you're doing. Property investing is a numbers game. You have to look at what the cash flow is on the property. What do I mean by that? The amount of cash coming in by way of rent and the amount of cash going out by way of mortgage payments, rent, uh, insurance, property management fees, maintenance, that kind of thing. So uh, you need to buy a, you know, a, a property that gives you really good cash flow. Ideally, you want to be in at least a neutral cash flow situation. You don't want to be having to prop up a rental property by hundreds of dollars a week. So you need to choose your property carefully. So you need to do an analysis of lots of different properties and find one where those kind of numbers stack up. But basically, when you're going into property, uh, most of your gains are going to be made on, on the capital gain. So, um, but you know, you're going to limit yourself quite severely and put yourself at huge risk if the cash flow is really, really bad. So, you know, a lot of people think, oh, you know, I can just buy, you know, standard three bedroom home and rent that out. Usually, a family home doesn't make a good rental because you've got far too much money tied up in it. You know, rents are very kind of what I call sticky. You know, they you can only charge rent within a certain range. And it's not related terribly well to the value of the property. So if you've got a house that's worth a million dollars, you're not going to rent it out for the same as what you could rent out to $500,000 properties. It's going to be a lot less. So you've got to find that sweet spot where you've got an okay kind of property that's of a reasonable standard. Because, you know, uh, but, you know, where, the, uh, where you're getting good rent, because at the end of the day, for your tenants, you know, rent is an expense that they don't really want to have. So they want to pay the least amount of rent. And they, so long as they've got a roof over their head and it's comfortable, warm and dry, 
they're happy. They don't don't need to live in a mansion or you know three bedroom family home. So you've really got to do your homework in terms of finding a property where the numbers stack up, where you're not going to be left you know hundreds of dollars short each week to to top that up. Um, I've got a question so, in the chat. Um, yep. So Carly's asked, um, looking at selling my home in one year, hopefully when the market has recovered, when my fixed term mortgage of 2.79% ends, I'm then looking at going traveling, moving countries in 2024. I have some savings, $5,000. Is it worth me overpaying my mortgage before the term ends or keeping it as a traveling mortgage? keeping that money as a traveling or moving budget? Wow. Well, um, you know, I really... Um, like put that 5K are... on her mortgage or use the 5K as a as a traveling moving budget. I think that's the question, isn't it, Carly? Well, look, I, I was just going to say, I would really caution people against going right out of the property market to go traveling. You, you know, you're better to still have some exposure. A lot of people got caught out in that last boom period. You know, I had some tenants in one of my properties, actually, who sold up a house because it was a big, huge house with a big mortgage. They couldn't afford it. They sold up, um, uh, decided to rent from me, and then thought they'll just wait and see what happens with all during COVID, of course, wait for the property prices to come down. Well, the property prices just took off on them. And in the end, they couldn't get back into the market. You know, and this can happen really, really easily. My advice is to always have your, you know, have your toe in the water kind of thing. And if you're not going to live in it yourself, you know, maybe sell that one and buy another one that you can rent out so that you've got something to come back to when you come back from overseas because the market could well have moved significantly in that time. Um, yeah, so that... That's something I'd really like you to think about. You know, unless you're moving permanently overseas, which might be a different story. But you know, I think the sooner you can get into the property market, the better and stay in there. You know, even if you leave the country, you can get a property manager to look after your property while you're away. And you know, um, that's a, it's a far safer option in the longer term. But maybe you want to get some some personalised financial advice about that. You know, because it does depend a lot on your circumstances. Talk to your mortgage broker, talk to your bank, uh, and get and ask that question of them. Um, they should give you an honest answer. Thank you. Hopefully that answered your question a bit, Carly. Um, but yeah, thanks, Liz. That's great. Anybody's got any other questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat. Otherwise, Liz, you could just carry on on your vein of thought. Right. Okay. So we've talked a little about. Uh, you know, just reinforcing what I've said, just said, you don't need to live in the house you own. And if you're looking at buying your first home, um, you know, you don't have to live in your first home yourself other than for the first six months if you're using KiwiSaver. <laughs> Better to be in the market uh, and, um, you know, you can rent out uh, your house that you own and, and uh, rent somewhere else. I have a daughter in Sydney that does that. You know, she lives in Sydney, can't afford to buy in Sydney. So she's bought a rental property in New Zealand where it's more affordable. Uh, so, yeah, think uh, a bit laterally and pay off your mortgage before you invest. We've talked about that. So, yeah, paying off your mortgage faster. So I use a system called chunking. So uh, what I mean by this, uh, and again, you'll find more information about this on my website. Uh, so divide your mortgage into chunks. So we've talked about having a floating segment, which is a, a line of credit or an offset account which means you can put savings in there, but you know you can get you can get the money back out again if you want to, if you need it. Uh, have some fixed for the short or medium term and some fixed for the medium or long term. Although you do have to take into account the, the interest rate environment. So right now, I think interest rates are peaking, so you might want to err more towards the short term end of things. But... Um, so <clears throat> what you do is you, um, if you've got part of your mortgage as a line of credit, you plough all your savings in there, knowing that you can get them back out at any time. And then once your balance is down to zero and you've spent all the money that you need to spend on your short-term goals, when your first fixed component comes off fixed, 
you draw down that line of credit again. So if you had $20,000 line of credit, draw it down, pay off $20,000 off that fixed mortgage, and then um, refix that again, and then start working away at getting your line of credit back to zero again. So, so for example, if you've got, uh, say, a $500,000 mortgage in total, I'm talking probably unrealistic numbers, but I'm just <laughs> bringing that easy numbers here. So you might have, say, 50000 that's floating. That leaves you 450 uh, to fix. And you might split that into two chunks of, what are we got, at least 225,000. So with your 50,000 floating, you plow your savings in. You might be taking a bit out along the way to do your holidays, whatever. Uh, when that gets down to zero and your first fixed component comes off, your, your two, uh, two, 225, you might want to take uh, a bit out of that. Um, take 25,000, say, out of your 50,000 line of credit and pay a chunk off your 225 amount. So then you're just refixing at 200. Now, I know I've gone through that really quickly, but it's a way of um, getting the, the best use out of your money and paying the least possible interest, which is um, a good thing because an interest, compound interest, is what's the real color. So, um, yeah, again, more information on that uh, uh, on my website if, you, if you're interested. So that's what I call the chunk, chunking system. It works really, really well. And um, it's just a, a matter of, of uh, being disciplined with using that line of credit. You should only be drawing down the money in that line of credit for things that are, you know, things that are your goals. Um, uh, because that's what you're ideally going to be using to get rid of your mortgage quicker. Right, <clears throat> so that, that one, um, so a bit more on that. So set the limit of your floating mortgage to cover your emergency fund, your short-term savings, and your additional savings that you want to do to repay your mortgage. So if you've got cash on hand of 30000 to cover your emergency fund and short-term savings, you believe you can save 20000 over the next year to pay off your mortgage then set your floating mortgage to say 50,000. Uh, some people will get, find it hard to get their heads around that. <laughs> anyway, you'll be able to watch the recorded version if you want to go over it again. Um, so yeah, then you divide the remaining mortgage into one, two or three chunks at a fixed rate, depending on how fast you think interest rates are, are moving. So the default position might be, you know, fixed half for a year and half for two years. But at the moment, you might want to go you know, a bit shorter than that. Um, so you yeah, save as much money as you can into your floating facility, uh, try and get, get the balance to zero. And then once your fixed uh, interest chunk reaches maturity, pay off a chunk, and then just keep saving into your floating facility. So next, I just want to talk briefly about, you know, once you've got rid of your mortgage, how do you invest? And this applies to KiwiSaver as well. So you really need to make sure your KiwiSaver is in the right fund. Uh, make sure you're not in a default fund. Make sure you've actively chosen what your KiwiSaver fund type is. So any uh, investment portfolio comprises four different asset classes. And this, this applies to your KiwiSaver as well. So you've got some cash holdings, some fixed interest, some property, and some shares. And your portfolio or your KiwiSaver fund will perform differently depending on the mix between uh, those different asset classes. So they all have a different role uh, in your portfolio. So as we'll see here, you know, cash is a very stable investment. It's a uh, low return, but it's low risk. And then up to the other end of the spectrum, we've got shares, which are high return, high risk. Now, the key thing about investing in shares is that we know they give the highest return over the long term. Some people get a bit nervous about investing in shares. You know, they're volatile. You know, they go up and down. Um, but uh, you have to bear in mind, it's a bit like a man going up a hill with a yo-yo. <laughs> so a lot of ups and downs, you're going up a hill. There's an upward trend line when you're investing in shares. So the trick to investing in shares is to invest for a long time. So 
if you've got a long investment horizon, then you need to be probably heavily exposed to shares. If you're in KiwiSaver and you're still saving up for your house deposit, you might only have a short investment time horizon. So you might want to be down towards the other end of the spectrum. You know, if you're planning on buying a house in the next three years or so, you might want to be in a more stable investment in case the share market drops suddenly by 20% and there goes part of your deposit. So um, your investment time frame doesn't end at the time that you retire. It ends at the time you die, right? So if you're planning to live to 95, you've got a very long time ahead of you in terms of you know, how long you're investing for. Some of your money will still be invested later in life. So don't just think up to retirement. So if you're in your 50s, you've still got a long way to go, you know, till you're 95. There's still a chunk of your money that uh, you can safely invest in volatile investments and know that over that long term you're going to get a good return so you need to just understand you know what your what we call your risk profile is um you know how long is your investment time frame how do you feel about your portfolio going up and down on value uh, but bear in mind that if you're at a conservative end you're going to get a low a much lower return and over the course of your working life that can make a huge difference to where you end up so we have what's called, when we're investing an asset allocation, and you'll see this in your KiwiSaver. Um, so have a check and see what the asset allocation is for your KiwiSaver fund, how much is in each of those different asset classes. So um, uh, what we call a balanced portfolio is roughly half cash and fixed interest, which is very stable and low return, and roughly half might be in the growth assets, probably in shares, which are quite volatile, but which over the long term will give you the highest return. So there are lots of tests online you can do to see what your risk profile is. But for me, the, you know, the biggest determinant is how long you intend to be investing for. So if you've got a long time ahead of you, don't be afraid to um, get into some of those growth assets where you're going to get the highest return. There's an interesting question in the chat um, from Lorna said that she likes the blocking mortgage idea, but that her mortgage has just been fixed for two years. Is there anything that she can do until it, be it comes off fixed? Oh, she'd have to talk to her lender. Um, sometimes lenders will let you change without um, penalty. So, yeah, that, that would be up for discussion. It just it's entirely at the lender's discretion. And it depends how long ago she fixed. You know, there might be a, a window of opportunity if it's just, you know, within the last few days or something where she can change your mind. Um, but yeah, best to talk to her lender about that. Yeah. Okay, cool. And then there's one other question because I know we're sort of coming up close to time. Um, with the example before with the 50,000 and offset mortgage, but putting 20 towards mortgage when it comes unfixed, do you have a minimum of savings in, I think it's offset of 50K, so you don't get stung with the high interest rates? Didn't quite understand. Um, well, with the so with the line of credit, you only get charged interest on the money that you've drawn down or the you know the negative the negative balance so to speak so yeah I'm not quite sure what she was meaning there so you when you when you take some out to pay some off your your fixed mortgage then you'll start clocking up interest on that amount that you've taken out um, but the idea is that you'll then you know focus your savings on getting that back down to zero again as quickly as you can Okay. Um, well, hopefully sure that answers Sarah, Sarah not, your question. If not, then <laughs> might have yeah, to get well, that by email later, Sarah, to me, and then we can direct you in the right direction. Um, yes, but also have a look at the recorded version again, or you know, I can send. Uh, you know, there is some. Um, there is an article I've written on it, which, uh, which I can send out if people want more information about that. So. Yeah, so we're sort of coming up to the last four sort of minutes um, and I know you've covered a lot of information and answered some questions. I just want to make sure that um, if people feel like there's questions that they haven't had answered, um, sure. 
Liz and I talked about, you can either go to Liz's website, which I stuck in the chat, but I'll bring that back to the front of the chat. Um, and or you can email me so that I can then direct your questions back to Liz to see what the best channel for you to get or the best resource for you to get your answers through. Um, and I guess the other thing that I've picked up, Liz, is sometimes it's good just to have a chat with either your financial advisor or a financial advisor, or like in um, Lorna's case, perhaps the lender, so that, you know, you can see if there's anything you can do, Lorna, about that. Can you change yeah. it? Can you, can you, um, yeah, do anything about that in the time that it's in? So mm -hmm. I guess just in the last few minutes, um, do you have any sort of just recap tips or anything? You just, there's so many gold nuggets. I've personally taken a page of notes. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was pretty good with my money, but like I was <laughs> like, okay, I can do some things <laughs> differently here. This is really cool. So what are your well, kind of so, closing tips and things like that? What would you well, like I think, to? I was just going to touch on, you know, make sure you protect your wealth. You know, your biggest asset is your income. Make sure you've got income protection insurance. You know, take, have a look at how much risk you're taking by not protecting your biggest asset. Um, or, you know, look at health insurance, all those kind of things that can erode your money. Um, make sure your contracting out agreements are in place if, you're, if you've got a partner and you're not quite sure how that relationship is going to end up, get a will done, all that sort of thing. So this is just the summary page here, the, like my last slide. Just, you know, set your goals, spend less than you earn, Manage your money that proactively. Don't let your money manage you. You choose how your money is going to be spent and when. Pay off debt. Debt is a killer. You don't want to be into compound interest. Create some wealth through saving and investing and protect your wealth. So that's basically, that sums it all up, really. Mm. You know, it's, it's not rocket science, but the hard thing is spending less than you earn. And it's isn't society doesn't help us do that, does it? I don't know if anyone else no. agrees in the in the session, but like really, every ad on TV, everything you come across, you know, buy, 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 have now, have now, feel this now, go here now, do this now, have more now. You know, it's That's just right. everything is geared to us spend, spend, spending without yeah. thinking about are we spending less than we earn. So um it's yeah, been the fantastic. Old FOMO, it's the FOMO thing, isn't it? You know, fear of missing out on a bargain or a, you know, yeah. Or something. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, totally. Look, it's been amazing. Thank you so much, Liz. Um, there's been so many gold nuggets. I um can't wait. Uh yeah, love an even longer session and a follow-up session, perhaps. So I'll talk to Liz about that. We'll 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 have a we'll have a cut it all offline about that and see what we can do. But look, it's absolutely amazing. And um, so if people are listening back to this, I hope you also get some incredible value out of it because I know I have. Uh, it was very, very well worth it. So thank you for your time because, you know. Oh, look, taken... I really enjoyed it. As I say, I love talking about money. I could talk for hours about it. <laughs> <laughs> I've got lots of answers for lots of different questions. So, yeah. Yeah. But, and, and... You know, but also, you know, get some advice from people, you know. It's, it doesn't often it doesn't cost anything to get advice. I really encourage people to do that. Go and you know increase your knowledge and 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 understand the consequences of the choices that you're making. Fantastic. So I'm going to stop recording.